Growing your own fruit and veg and sharing the produce with family and friends is one of life's great luxuries. And over the last hundred years, this has increased greatly. People doing more and more of it themselves in their own back gardens and allotments. But this has come about as a result of calamitous global events and huge social change. On my journey through 400 years of garden history, I've discovered the hidden messages that revealed a forbidden 17th century faith. I've seen how the desire to create an Arcadian dream gave rise to the great landscape gardens of the 18th century. And I've learnt how Victorian technology went hand in hand with colonial expansion to enable us to grow new and exotic varieties from around the world. Look how beautiful it is. I'm now moving into the 20th century. This is an age of war, social upheaval, and huge technological advancements, all of which transformed our gardens. And I'll be discovering who were the most influential figures in 20th century gardening. This is a photograph of one of my heroes. He's one of the greatest garden designers this country has ever produced. And I'll be seeing how technology has enabled modern nurseries to mass produce plants by the million. Our color is slowly beginning to emerge. Yeah. We can just see it appearing here, and then it's starting to look like a field of flowers. I believe that gardens are every bit as important as the buildings that we live and work in. And if we can unearth their secrets and listen to their stories, we get a unique insight into our history and what makes us the people that we are today. Here in the middle of London, set six stories up above the River Thames with St Paul's on one side and Tower Bridge on the other and the great corporate temple soaring around us is a garden. It's a garden that's working hard. It's providing relief and a green space for the hundreds of employees of the bank behind those glass walls. It's for corporate entertainment. Practical, cheap, pleasant. It's a brand. You can see it from all around. As the city grows up and up, the gardens have to rise up with them. As you look around, there are other little pockets of garden showing off what good souls and how cultured these corporate dragons are. And there's a very human side to it. They're growing vegetables, which go into the canteen to feed the workers. Now, it's doing this as part of a world that couldn't have been imagined by the garden makers 100 years earlier, at the beginning of the 20th century. In 1900, Britain was emerging from the Industrial Age. Huge numbers of the population had steadily moved away from the countryside to find work in increasingly overcrowded and polluted cities, all connected by a railway network that could now transport people faster than anyone could have thought possible 100 years earlier. But with this urbanization came a growing nostalgia for a vanishing rural way of life and a desire to return to nature. And this reaction against the wholesale industrialization of the Victorian era was reflected in a new style of garden, created right at the start of the 20th century here at Hestercombe in Somerset. So this is classical. Victorian bedding. Plants raised in hot houses, because they could. 
They had the start. They had the heating. And from here, all you can see is the view. Then if you go to the balustrade and look over, you have what is both a beautiful and, for its time, radical garden. Although to the modern eye, this might seem fairly formal in its symmetry and planting, in its day, it would have looked startlingly natural compared to the contemporary Victorian gardens when nature was controlled with an iron hand. The authors of this new style were two figures that were a huge influence on subsequent 20th century gardens. I've got pictures of Gertrude Gicon and Edwin Lutchins here. Now, Lutchins was a rather brilliant architect, and Gicon, the doyen of British gardening. And together, they were greater than the sum of their parts. They made gardens which dramatically changed the way that we garden. Both Jekyll and Lutchins were heavily influenced by the arts and craft movement, which reacted to the mechanization of industry by advocating an aesthetic based on traditional craftsmanship and materials. So at Hestercombe, we see Lutchins making a garden based upon stone quarried from the estate and hand-finished by local masons. This area seems to me so typical of early 20th century gardening. And what that means is you've just stepped out and crossed the threshold. You've left the 19th century behind. You're now in the 20th century. And it has a kind of attention to detail using local materials that is very typical of Lutchins. Uh, and these patterns and designs, contrasting shapes and forms and colors, sets up the space, it's circular. You've got away from the four square solidity of the house. And this is a kind of antechamber. Okay, we've less one century, we're about to enter the next. Cleanse yourself, prepare for what's to come. A few steps and then bang, you get a really dramatic new view. You can't see this at all from the top terrace. And it sums up everything about this new age of gardening. It's sensitive to place, it's sensitive to materials, relishing the stone and the structure. And yet, the planting is fascinating. Gertrude Jekyll was a painter before failing eyesight made her turn to garden design. And she uses Lutchin's framework as an artist would a canvas painting a blanket of color and texture on top, as if nature has been allowed free reign. Jekyll loved color, but she loved it by restricting her palette. So on this very hot south-facing side in the wall, you've got Santalina, you've got the lavenders, you've got salvias coming through there, the stachys, these silvery blues, glaucous colors that create the clumps and the shapes. And actually, you feel that, and you've got the, the oil. Oh, that smells fantastic. The, the oiliness and the resinous. She understood all that and, and was able to incorporate it. And there, behind Lutchin's wall with its planting pockets, deliberately put in from day one. And he gave her every opportunity to just flow, just go with the colour. And that gives their gardens a kind of easy, comfortable assurance that is just miles away from the tightly controlled, almost uh, masterful intentions of the 19th century garden. Although Jekyll's planting schemes were primarily designed for wealthy clients, she wrote prolifically and reached a much wider public, and in particular, the growing middle classes who enthusiastically embraced her style. And 100 years on, she is still influencing gardeners today. 
Jekyll's original planting plans give us a fascinating insight into the mind at work behind Hester Coombe and serve as an invaluable source for the head gardener, Claire Reed. It's really useful. It, it is like you have to sort of put, you can e more easily put yourself into her shoes and try and figure out what she was trying to do. Lutchens, you know, does the hard landscaping and she almost just throws a, a blanket of flowers mm. over the top. But you do see clearly from this the way that she saw it as, as a flow. Mm. The, the shapes are very organic. Yeah, definitely. Almost like a, a paintbrush sweep, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They are. They create almost a collage. And actually, we don't think she ever came here. She, yeah. she probably designed this remotely, in which case she may well have just been given this drawing and sort of filled it in. Yes. It was very hard to design like that without seeing something. She never came here to do it. She never came here and saw it. No. That's, that there is the only thing she ever had. Yeah, that's right. As Interesting far that, as we it? know, yeah. And here we are, 110 years later, sitting in the garden that you're so carefully preserving. Yes. To her plan. I don't suppose that when Jika was doing this, there were any concessions to ease of management, were there? Absolutely not. No, that, you know, labour would have been cheap. They could yeah. have had what they wanted, I guess. And how many gardeners would there have been when she did this? Well. Here's a photograph. This is 1912, and this is the gardens team then. 17 gardeners. Mm. All men as well. Yeah. All holding the tools of their trade. Mm. Oh, the head gardener there. He doesn't look like he gets his hands very dirty, No, does he? he doesn't. Yeah, I think he points. And of course, if that's taken in 1912, I wonder how many of the younger ones were still alive five years later or so. It's a frightening thought, yeah. isn't it? The outbreak of the First World War in 1914 was to have a devastating impact on the grand estates of Edwardian Britain. Many skilled gardeners were killed, and those that did make it home no longer wanted to work in service. The old order of British society had been irreparably shattered. Some of our finest gardens were left to become overgrown and forgotten, and those that did survive now began to embrace new labour-saving technology. I'm heading off to visit somebody who I know is mad about garden machinery and collects it avidly. The reason I'm going to see him is to see if the mechanisation that came with the war had any kind of beneficial dividend in peacetime and impacted into the way that we go. I'm told that Christopher Proudfoot has one of the largest collections of lawnmowers in the country. How many have you got? I don't know. I stopped counting at 300. That was a long time ago. To get a feel for the way that garden machinery changed after the war, Christopher first shows me a pre-war mower dating from 1910. The ANN Auxiliary 20 inch yes. chain lawnmower. Can we use it? Of course we can use it. OK, where are we going? Down there? Down there, yep. Yeah. Right, I tell you what, if we're going to mow... Yes. I'm going to take my jacket off. That sounds like a very good idea. And do you want me to pull or push? Whichever you like. You Hang on, like? I think you're yours. the master, it's your house, you better be steering. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll be the boy. <laughs> fine. So off we go. Yeah, just, just keep it taut and you'll be fine. That's OK. It. Like its horse-drawn predecessor in the 19th century, this mower is still a two-man job. You'd have either a man in front or a lad in front or, or a donkey or a pony or whatever you happen to have available. Right, it, OK. It's very heavy and it needs a bit of extra assistance. I'll, I'll be lad, donkey and right. pony combined. What was, what was the instigator of the development of mowers from this point? Well, the instigator was, I suppose, the development of the internal combustion engine, plus, of course, the First World War, which meant that a lot of people went off to the war and either didn't come back or when they did come back, they knew all about engines. And the mowers got lighter, partly because of the use of lighter materials and partly because of things like ball bearings and machine-cut gears. And in the 20s, 
mowers got much, much easier to use for one man. This is, this is where most of the motor mowers live. Mostly date from the 20s and 30s. It's an early two-stroke engine, the sort of thing you'd have had on a motorbike. Does this have a kick start or, yeah, a, or this, a handle start? This has a handle start. Can I do it? Um, it's so tricky that it's probably better if I do it. OK, but, uh, all I'm, right. I'm not... Oh, let's go! No. Oh. No, no, you see, no, it always does that. Um, so I'll have to try again. Ah. Yeah, that's what John, you need to you do. You manage that. OK. I'll manage this, cos that yeah. takes skill, and this just takes a little bit of <laughs> coordination. You're doing it the wrong way. Oh, that's... Will it explain something? Uh, oh, no, you aren't. No, 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 that's right, that's okay. right. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. In theory, at least, this is a machine operated by just one person. We'll get there. <laughs> it is more difficult than it looks. Yes. But you're indulging me, because <laughs> I... <laughs> The arrival of motorised lawnmowers after the war not only saved many of the big estates who no longer had the luxury of a large workforce, but it also played a major part in the evolution of the gardens that belonged to the burgeoning middle classes. For the first time, tightly mown, immaculate lawns were a relatively cheap and easy option. And so they soon became a staple feature of every suburban garden. It's clear that the accelerated mechanisation that happened as a result of the First World War did play into peacetime gardens. And the effect is still with us now. And I'm off to see another garden, which I've long known about but never been to before, which also had an effect on the way that we garden as a result of the First World War. But this belonged to an artistic elite. And it was the way that they lived and viewed the world that was influential as much as the way that they kept their gardens. During the war, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant, who was a conscientious objector, moved to Charleston Farmhouse in Sussex. They were both artists and members of the Bloomsbury set, a group of radical artists, writers and intellectuals. This is extraordinary because just this room is a distillation of everything I know about the Bloomsbury Group. I've been brought up with them as, as a really important part of the culture of the 20th century. Charleston reflected a new post-war liberalism expressed through art. It was the antithesis of the restrictions of their Victorian parents and the world that they were breaking free from. Here are pictures of them. There's, there's Vanessa Bell herself, who was married to Clive Bell, and she lived here with her lover, here, Duncan Grant, who's pictured with his lover, the economist Maynard Keynes. You can see already that it was a complicated household. It's easy now to forget just how influential the Bloomsbury Group was in redefining art, philosophy, and even morality in the early 20th century. This is the studio that Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant built. And like the rest of the house, the art spills off and, and covers every surface and, and is reflected in every utensil in the room. And, of course, it didn't just spread from the canvas onto the carpets and the cushions and the fireplaces. It spread outside into the garden. And this is a garden that many of us would feel at home with today. It has all the looseness and bursts of colour that you find at Hester Coombe, 
but has a spontaneity that you'd never find in a garden designed by Lutchins and G. Corp. The man charged with keeping the essence of Charleston's garden going is Mark Duval. What was the spirit of the place? What is it that you're trying to preserve? It was, um, it was a painter's garden. They almost treated the garden as they would a canvas, so a daub of this. The effect was everything. A wonderful dither of colour or a sweet disorder. Sometimes it can cross over in disaster. Disorder, disaster is quite close. It would not have been a typical garden, would it? Middle-class, educated people mm. would not have had a slightly chaotic, rambly, cottagey garden. No, things weren't over-cared for. Uh, they might come back from, from Lewis with uh, something they just saw in the market and plonk it in. There was no grand plan. So, in a way, they were no better gardeners than a good amateur gardener. What this garden represents, with its dither of plants and its slight sense of anarchy, is freedom. Freedom from the repression of the working world and morality and discipline. Freedom to get up in the morning and just be creative. And it was through this outpouring of artistic expression in the 20s and 30s that some of our greatest 20th century gardens were conceived. In amongst the complicated tangle of Bloomsbury love lives, Vanessa Bell's sister, Virginia Woolf, was the lover of Vita Sackville West, who in the 1930s began to make Sittinghurst which is still one of the most famous gardens in the world and a mecca for any serious gardener. The poet and author Vita Sackville West made Sittinghurst with her husband, Harold Nicholson. And between them, he largely designing the layout and she being responsible for most of the planting, they helped to start a fashion, which is still going strong, for the notion of a garden as a series of enclosed spaces or rooms each with their own colours and themes. It took the very best of 17th century formal garden design and added to it the informal abundance and love of plants that was evolving in the 20th century. However, gardens like Sissinghurst were still the domain of the privileged few who could afford to indulge their creativity by making their own private horticultural paradise. But that freedom was short-lived. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. As the Second World War began in September 1939, pleasure gardening was again put on hold for the second time in 25 years. Nevertheless, gardening and our gardens became a key part of the war effort. So I've arranged to come to Cambridge University Library to meet up with Chris Going, who's going to show me how the government set about allocating land for food production. These are the land use maps that Professor Stamp put together in the 1930s, a series of, of categories of land use. It was the first detailed land survey since the Doomsday Book and had been done so that the government could know what land could be requisitioned for producing food. This is the dense urban landscape, right. the, the red. Um, the purple is housing with gardens or open space associated with it, which was sufficiently big to allow vegetables to be grown. So you're looking e effectively at the suburbs in purple and, and the inner city in red. So the, the purple? 
those gardens had to grow food. So that was I would have said they had to grow food. Yeah, but, but presumably the red was in trouble. There's virtually nothing you could do in, in those areas mm. other than put public open spaces like Regent's Park, like Hyde Park, to, to, to grow food. At the end of the war, there was an urgent need to rebuild the cities that had been devastated by the Blitz. But there wasn't time to send out teams of cartographers to carefully map them. So they took a shortcut and used aerial photography. The earliest ones are taken in June, July 1945, so right at the end of the war, and these show the public spaces which were actually being used for um, the growing of food. And looking here, there's the Albert Memorial, the yeah. Albert Hall, and an incredible stream, a line of allotments. Absolutely. Absolutely. Running through Kensington Gardens into yeah. Hyde Park. Yeah. The public were expected to cultivate their gardens and allotments in a campaign that became known as Dig for Victory. So London, the big urban centre, has reacted to the Blitz and U-boat stockades by creating temporary allotments, by digging up gardens, by growing whatever they could in cities. Absolutely. These pictures were taken for the repair of these towns and for the building of new towns. How did we react? Did we build more allotments in case we got bombed again? I don't think they did, no. I don't think they felt that the near future would be like the recent past. It was now going to be a time of peace and eventually, they hoped, plenty. With hindsight, it does seem extraordinary that after two world wars, both of which had threatened to reduce the country to starvation, that allotments, which had been central to survival in both, were not a key part of the rebuilding strategy. But at the end of the war, there was an overwhelming sense that people wanted a fresh start for a new world. So the government spurned the proven practicality of allotments and instead turned to an avant-garde, rather esoteric garden designer to help them in this huge rebuilding project. This is a photograph of one of my heroes. He's called Sir Geoffrey Jellicoe and he's one of the greatest garden designers this country has ever produced. But before seeing his vision for the new towns and cities, I've come to Shoot House in Wiltshire, the home of Susie and John Lewis. The garden was one of Jellicoe's later works and his own personal favorite. And it's a really good illustration of the way that he used abstract ideas as a central part of his carefully manipulated landscapes. I've always felt that it, it must be a double-edged sword living in what is essentially a famous garden, because it's revered by people who've never been here, and yet you have to live in it. It's your home. Well, that's the point. It is home. Mm. And I think one forgets about all the razzmatazz and just loves it. There is always a slight trepidation when you visit a garden that you've, you've seen pictures of for half a lifetime. You think, oh, God, I hope it is good. I'm the sure secret it is. here, yeah. don't look left. Okay. Till you get right to the top. Why not? You'll see. Okay. Okay, I'm not looking left, I'm not looking left, I'm not looking left. No. I am looking left. You see, it's, it's very curious because there is both that incredible familiarity, because you've seen lots of pictures. At the same time, it's different because it's real and the trees, I can see the height and, and the sound of the water and all these things that aren't there. By diverting the source of an old Roman spring, Jellicoe created a series of rills, pools, fountains and cascades, all carefully designed to evoke specific moods and feelings and to tap into our subconscious. And the rill is just part of the larger garden, which at first may appear to look like other large established gardens, but in fact is all based around our response to water at every level, from the abstract to the immediate. Mm. 
One of the things that fascinates me about Jellicoe's work is this way that he taps into the subconscious and that water, the way it moves and its sound taps directly into that. Do you feel that in the garden? Oh, definitely. There is, there is serious magic here. Mm. The copper is bent differently at each level mm. and it's supposed to sound like music. Right. And this is combining the magic of water and the magic of shape and nature and life. As well as ordering the rill, so the water flows in a straight line as Jellicoe wants it, he imposed this grid of box hedges, parterres, squares, borders. There are a thousand gardens with exactly this kind of idea. But they don't function as other gardens do. They're not rooms. You can see over the walls, the hedges are too low. They're not borders, because each one is like a little garden. And yet they're clearly integrated. And in fact, what Jellicoe seems to be doing is imposing a kind of order just sufficient to allow the subconscious, or disorder if you like, to have free reign. Jellicoe wrote that he should like everybody to experience life at a much deeper level than that of the visible world. What fascinated him was the way that art could be created out of the combination of conscious, practical application and the subconscious. And you can't control the subconscious. It wells up and you make of it what you will. And it's very important and relevant that this garden is based around the spring that is here, that has been coming up out the ground since time immemorial, which has brought people here since the Romans. And he shapes it and he channels it. And there are references here to history. That view before me is deliberately reminiscent of William Kent Rauscham, made in the late 1730s. Jellicoe knew his garden history, he knew his art, he knew his music. He's collated it all together here at Shute House. And that's in rhythm with music, with poetry, with painting that's been produced throughout the 20th century. And gardens traditionally haven't done this. This is absolutely a modern idea. And the result is something absolutely unique. I rang Sir Geoffrey Jellicoe up once, just before he died. And he was charming and full of life and talking about design. And he said, you know, I'm not at all interested in plants. And what he meant by that was that it wasn't plants and botany and the cultivation of plants that drove him. It was design, landscape, ordering it, shaping it, tapping into the subconscious forces within landscape. And although I think this is one of the great gardens, and I think that he is the 20th century greatest garden designer, it wasn't just gardens that he was interested in. It was landscape and how mankind related to landscape, be that a small back garden or an entire town. Jellicoe's opportunity to create a new urban landscape came in the 1950s. To address the chronic lack of housing after the Second World War, the government set about planning 22 new towns. 
Jeffrey Jellicoe had been involved in rebuilding war damage and was offered the chance to design an entire new town and he chose Hemel Hempstead and worked on it for a year. In fact, he was paid the princely sum of a thousand pounds for it. But his proposal was regarded as too avant-garde and was rejected. However, he did subsequently design a water garden that runs through the middle of the town. I can see it there, snaking through. And, and that word snaking is very apposite because he transformed his design to deliberately be a snake. So we can see the body of the water running through. And then the lake at the far end is the head of the snake. And, and he famously wrote that if London could have the serpentine, then Hemel Hempstead could have the serpent. Now the point about this was not that it was a nice idea that people could enjoy, but that it struck deep into the collective subconscious. So that municipal landscape, places where people lived and worked and played, would be enhanced and enriched, despite the fact they were unaware of it. And that design could do this, not just in gardens, but deliberately as part of working lives. To give the illusion of space at the heart of the busy new town, Jellicoe makes the water seem more extensive by varying the width of the channel and creating vanishing points. And like Shoot House, the weirs are carefully designed to make different sounds. The path along the bank deliberately meanders to slow people down, to create the time to enjoy the garden. I'm meeting up with Dominic Cole, the landscape architect who's been given the job of renovating this really significant piece of 20th century design. It was like a bursting opportunity to rethink how cities work. Jellico, I think, is the master of, of the new towns. What is stunning here is the, the structure is all still here, the paths, the bridges, the water, as intended. He wanted to create mood. So here was very much about just, you, you might have been to do your weekly shop or whatever, but you, on the way back to the car park, you could just stop here for a minute and read the paper or whatever. So it, it really was about a, a breathing space between busy, bustling high street and getting back into your car and carrying on with your everyday life. Jericho used the, both his knowledge of subconscious and deliberately included it. Do you think it just stops here and, and, and is a, something that works on a level of art? Or has it genuinely spread through? Does it work in the way that he wanted it to work? The philosophy, blah, 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 doesn't sit at all comfortably with a, 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 our everyday understanding of the garden. But if, you, if Jellicoe was here describing it to you, you would be completely captivated. Now, I accept that most people would probably roll their eyes at the idea of a municipal garden designed to raid the collective subconscious. But this kind of approach was really central to modernist thinking in the decades following the war. It was a brave new world, the age that gave rise to the welfare state and utopian ideals. So the new town of Hemel Hempstead was built to reflect changing lifestyles and aspirations and a quiet revolution that was taking place in the country's back gardens. Hello, Roy. Hello, Monty, I believe. It is, it is very <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Come in. Thank you. There you go. I've come to see Roy and Pat Humphreys, who moved from bombed out southeast London after the war having applied for a brand new home and life in Hemel Hempstead. Who's that? Is that you? Yeah, some, some of the hair's going a bit there, isn't it? Isn't it? But, but, uh... Yeah, look, if you're going to be personal, <laughs> I can't handle it. Would you have had a garden in London? If you've got a house, do you think? Very unlikely. Very unlikely, yeah. My mother, she had a small front garden mm -hmm. and a city back garden. Mm -hmm. After that, was taken up with an air raid shelter. Yeah, but that's yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Roy and Pat belong to the generation who reached adult life just after the war. And job security, rising incomes and affordable housing meant more people like them could have their own homes and gardens. It's me pastime. Keeps it's me out of mischief. Yeah, it's beautiful. Do you follow garden fashions? 
No. I have, I have moments. I've had chrysanthemum moments. Mm -hmm. I've had dahlia moments. And I enjoy all. Oh, some have been a success. And some have been, we won't mention. And why do you go? I, I enjoy it and it's good for me. And I like to see the result. And my good lady, you know, she thoroughly enjoys it. At the beginning of the 20th century, less than half of us had a garden. Today, that figure has risen to something more like 90%, and gardening is the nation's most popular pastime. And this dramatic shift is perhaps the single most important development in the history of our gardens. Now, rising incomes and more leisure time played an important part in this development. But there were also key individuals who created the fashions and trends that made domestic gardening accessible to all. Now, you wouldn't think that this was the entrance to one of the 20th century's most profound gardening revolutions. This is Blooms of Bressingham, the garden and former nursery of a maverick entrepreneur named Alan Bloom who in the 1960s and 70s played an important role in inspiring the nation to add colour to their back gardens. What was revolutionary was that Alan Bloom came out with a spade and just dug borders. Now, you can see from the shape of them that they're not particularly oval or spherical. They don't actually look designed at all. They've just got nice flowing curves now, he was growing mainly herbaceous perennials. They were easy to grow. They died down in winter. You didn't have to look after them. And you could have lots of colour. Now, if you think about it, this is completely at odds with everything that went before, because if this had been before the Second World War, where the infants of Sissinghurst, Lutchins, Jekyll, they would have taken the house and they would have taken sight lines from the windows and from the doors and paths and put in yew hedges and maybe walls if they could afford it and there will be garden rooms. None of this. This is just an open space, big beds, packed with plants. And of course, this was accessible to everybody. You didn't need to have a field to work in. If you had a back garden with some grass, you could just cut into it. It wasn't just the novel idea of island beds filled with herbaceous plants that Alan Bloom was selling. He also bred over 170 new varieties of hardy perennials, and his nursery sold them to gardeners keen to replicate the style of his own garden. This became a huge commercial success, and Blooms of Bressingham became one of the largest nurseries in Britain. So this is your vantage point? Yes, we can look over the, the whole garden. Alan Bloom died in 2005, aged 98. His son, Adrian, took on the family business, having built his own garden, Foggy Bottom, just round the corner. This was my father's um, uh, wholesale catalogue um, that we still had a pony in those days which would uh, manage not to tread on plants. This was open ground perennials. Yeah. It was big nursery. So three and six, three and six, four shillings, seven and six, about 35p for Maybe. good plants. I shouldn't really let you look at wholesale prices, should I? No, well, never mind. This is history. This is <laughs> it history. Was, it is history. What do you think was driving the changes in, in the way that people garden, not just here, but, but right across the country in the 60s and 70s? Well, I think it was uh, certainly the social changes and um, the sort of freedom that was coming with people having cars and being able to travel a bit and the garden centres, you know. Gradually, all of those things gelled together. I remember early 70s, mm. this thing of being able to go out, think, say I'd like to buy a plant, and within an hour, mm. have it back in the garden. And don't forget, you know, actually, um, right from the beginning, um, the garden centres could open on a Sunday and do trade on a Sunday when it was closed to all other shopping. Garden centres, universal car ownership, suddenly made everything accessible at the same moment that another new feature of modern life, television, began to exert a huge influence. That's um, Percy Thrower. Look at the equipment. 
Yeah, 30 people, I think, they had with that crew. And oh, cable, really? cables, of course, everywhere. Um, this is a little bit later. This is at Foggy Bottom, and that's Peter Seabrook. Regular television and radio programs informed and inspired ever more people to get out and guard. And even the allotment, the savior of two world wars, became a leisure pursuit. And so, by the end of a century marked by huge social changes, we had truly become a nation of gardeners, with the horticultural industry now worth nine billion pounds to the economy. And plants that were once coveted by our ancestors as exotic treasures are now grown by the hundreds of thousands using computerized technologies. I've come to Double H Nursery in Havant, Hampshire, which specializes in growing plants destined for the major supermarkets. And it's a world away from any concept of gardening that most of us would recognize. The nursery manager, Howard Brame, is showing me around. What stage are we at now? We've got uh, cuttings that come in from Uganda, and the girls and boys are sticking them here, five in a pot. These people are, are doing thousands an hour. Trying to do 2,000 pots an hour, yeah. OK, well, I've taken thousands of cuttings in my life, but I have never done them as quickly as this. <laughs> so can I have a go? Certainly. Am I going to ruin your whole production setup? No, we'll let you have a go once again. OK, great. Sure you'll be OK. And, and just uh, off you go. Yeah, just a centimeter in from the edge of the pot, really. I'm not competitive, I'm just going to win. Oh, come on. Ah. It's getting the damn things out of your hand. It's yeah. the tricky... Ah. Whoops. Now, as a matter of interest, why is the conveyor belt going at this speed? We need to stick 30,000 pots a week, so it has to go at this speed to get 30,000 done in the five days. Now, we've got the teams around a bit. Yeah, because yeah, this must be fairly mind-numbing. Yeah. That's perfect. OK. Very good. <laughs> Now you can do it properly. Thousands of uniform chrysanthemums are produced here each day by using the latest computer and robot technology and creating an artificial ecosystem. It's a vivid illustration of how commercialized plant production has become. Maybe it will encourage the amateur gardener to stop being so frightened of taking cuttings. That's correct, and yes. Just take a cutting and stick the damn thing in and it will probably grow. Yeah, it will probably root. What are these guys doing? So these guys are pinching. 30,000 plants. Times five. A week. A week. Right, 150,000 pinches. That's right. And that's what these guys do. That colour is slowly beginning to emerge. Yeah, must it get older now, yeah. Yeah. We can just yeah. see it appearing here, and then it's starting to, to look like a, a field of, of flowers. Are these now ready to go? Yes, these are now having their final quality control. So what are you looking for with the quality control? We're looking for the right height plant, so... We're looking for a plant that's 18 to 25 centimetres from the top of the pot. And we're that's looking... 18, yeah. yeah. We're looking for any bad leaves to come off. We're looking for any, any pests, diseases, and um, the number of flowers that a customer requires. What, what, what is the number of flowers a customer requires? Typically, they're wanting now an instant effect, a plant that gives instant effect. So we're looking for about eight open flowers at least. Although you and I know, as gardeners, past the best. <laughs> that what we should really be buying is one with no open flowers at all, perhaps one so you can see the colour. That's correct, yes. And but... then when you get it, you should pinch it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what do you do with a plant that is 17 and a half centimetres or 26 centimetres? That would then go to... That would be graded out as, and have to go to a, um, a lower grade customer. Right, so, so anything outside those parameters is regarded as second class. That's second correct, grade. yeah. So that's now the finished article. How much will that sell for? 
That was sale for £2.50 to £2.99. And how much of that is profit? About 3p. Really? Only 3p, yes. That's a tiny margin, isn't it? It is, which is why we have to produce the numbers we do, the 30,000 a week, to make it economic. Nurseries can now raise tens of thousands of plants every day with minimum labour and to the exact specifications of the buyer, ready to be picked up astonishingly cheaply along with a weekly shop. And if that wasn't attractive enough, they might even get a bit of added sparkle. What's he spraying on there? He's, he's spraying a water-based glue on there at the moment so that we're going to glitter these plants. So you, you put glitter on. I have never seen this before. Now, you could say that 400 years of plant breeding and collection of the skills of nurserymen handed down from generation to generation of the technological developments in greenhouses and heating and lighting and plant protection come to this. A limited choice of plants strictly determined by height that are a throwaway commodity. But it also means that millions of people can enjoy flowers, can afford them, don't need to have gardening skills to do those things. In fact, don't even need to have a garden. Everybody has access now to plants. And this has never been more important. As the population rises and we cram ourselves into crowded towns and cities, living out our lives behind glass and metal, we have to find room for the natural world somehow whether it be a plant for the windowsill, a small back garden, a roof terrace for city bankers, or a public park. Over the last 150 years, parks have been an essential aspect of urban life, giving people the chance to stretch their legs, walk, play, and relax in the sunshine. And as we move into the 21st century, and more and more people are and will be living in cities, parks remain a key aspect of urban life. So I've come to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in Stratford, which is by a long way the biggest and most ambitious park made in recent times. To get a sense of the scale of the task involved in creating this new landscape, I've met the head of Parklands, Phil Askew. The park itself is about 240 acres in size. We planted about 6,000 semi-mature trees in the park. We planted the largest sown perennial meadow of its kind ever attempted in the world, several hectares. The wetlands you see down here in the River Lee, uh, we grew over 300,000 wetland plants to achieve that. So everything we're seeing, everything, everything looks seeing, natural, is being is, grown is, and is, planted. Is grown and planted. In the original brief for the park, designers were asked to look for inspiration from this country's rich gardening history. And I can clearly see the influence of Gertrude Jekyll in the planting clumps and drifts of the borders. Views open out, referring back to the landscape gardens of the 18th century, and the designs of William Kent and Capability Brown. Looking out at this, I know that it's, it's been artificially created but it looks very natural. Essentially, I'm looking on a Brownian landscape. Yes, it is. In many respects, I think what we have here is actually a picturesque landscape. It's, it, it's, it's a, it has a direct relationship going back through time of, of the British landscape movement, if you like. And the landscape is, in that sense, a very British mm. product. And in sentiment and ethos, it echoes the great Victorian parks that provided open spaces for workers. 
The Victorian Park was a place where people could go and walk and relax in surroundings that they couldn't get at home. And that role has pretty much spread through, hasn't yes, it, to the 20th it has. century. Yes. Are we doing exactly the same thing here, but just with different planting? I think to an extent we are. And there's no doubt that fantastic, good quality green space in cities is really important for people's health and well-being. But I think what we're doing here is also thinking about, well, what's happening in the next decade, the next 20, 30, 100 years? How does the urban landscape need to respond to what is a changing climate? Undoubtedly, what is much more intense rainfall events? How do we bring... <laughs> Diversity, lots of birds and animals into the centre of the city, where after all most people are living. My understanding is in the next 30 years almost 80% of the world's population will be living in cities. So how can we think about that and perhaps set out some ideas which will drive other large interventions in terms of landscape and public parks, etc. The Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park doesn't just look back to our gardening past for inspiration. The designers were also required to respond to the very particular environmental challenges that we face today. And thus, it seems a fitting place to end my journey through the last 400 years of our garden history. Along the way, I've been struck by how clearly garden design has echoed the events and changes in our society, whether it be as statements of faith in a time of religious conflict, or the creation of an Arcadian ideal of the British landscape. Technology has been a key factor in the evolution of our gardens. From the invention of plate glass to protect exotics, to the development of the mower that enabled us to maintain urban parks and tend our lawns. And as I visited many of this country's historic gardens, it was always brought home to me that gardens are made by people and they always reflect private whims and private passions. And finally, and what's shown so clearly here at the Olympic Park, is the way that if you want to make a garden that is truly modern and looks into the future, you must draw upon the past. And with gardens, as in almost everything in life, if you want to know where you're going, you need to know where you come from. Coming up, the rapper Professor Green shines a light 
on male suicide through the story of his estranged father. Suicide and Me, next.